the Broadway Melody. A movie released in 1929 which won the award for Outstanding Picture at the second Academy Awards. It's the first musical to have won and it's the first talkie to have won. But neither of these things are that notable because like I just said, this was only the second Academy Awards. It being a talkie though means we're now entering the logistically tricky world of hiding microphones. Will this movie introduce a song which goes on to be covered by many from Bing Crosby to Sting? Crosby? Why, it's cream in the can, baby! My name's Jonathan Hearn. I love movies. I'm interested in history, and I love Wikipedia. I've been watching every Oscars Best Picture winner in chronological order from the beginning, and for each movie I'm putting out an episode talking about it until my or the Oscars death. Whichever comes first. This is the next Best Picture! Life was a song You came along I stayed awake the whole night through. If I but dared to think you cared This is what I'd say to you You were meant for me I was meant for you that was me, Gene Kelly, and Charles King singing You Were Meant For Me. And it's a great genre, my name is John, to have worked with them. Charles King introduced the song, singing it, as we just heard, in the Broadway melody. Gene Kelly sings it in 1952's Singing In The Rain. More on that soon. In the Broadway melody, Charles King plays a character called Eddie Kearns. And he sings the song to Queenie Mahoney, played by Anita Page. She looks a little perturbed while he sings it at her, which is a far cry from Debbie Reynolds's absolute adoration atop a ladder of love as Gene Kelly sings it. Why is she so bothered? Oh, you're intrigued, aren't you? I, I can tell you're intrigued. All will be revealed. If at any point it looks like I'm about to descend a Wikipedia rabbit hole, we'll hear Follow the White Rabbit. Follow the White Rabbit. Follow the White Rabbit. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences presented the second Academy Awards on the 3rd of April 1930 at a banquet in the Coconut Grove of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. It picked up where the previous left off by genering movies released between the 1st of August 1928 and the 31st of July 1929. Any changes? Oh yes, they broadcast it for the first time on a local radio station, you might have heard of it, called KNX. I actually haven't heard of it, but it's still going to this day, it is two years older than the BBC, became part of the CBS radio network in 1936, and so was one of the stations which originally broadcast Orson Welles's adaptation of H.G. Welles's The War of the Worlds which famously panicked the listening audience by convincing them a Martian invasion was really taking place. There wasn't one. The chances of anything coming from Mars are incalculable. On the, white rabbit. the award nominees were not announced in advance. The de facto nominees for Outstanding Picture were Alibi, Crime Drama, United Artists, The Hollywood Review of 1929, Musical Comedy, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, in Old Arizona, Western, Fox Film Corporation. The Patriot, semi-biographical, semi-talky, Paramount Pictures. No complete copy found to date. And the Broadway Melody, which wins the award and is what I'm supposed to be talking about. Broadway is a road in Manhattan. It's in the theatre district and is whence the theatre genre Broadway gets its similar sounding name. A melody is a linear succession of musical tones that the listener perceives as a single entity. It's better than it sounds. 
The Broadway Melody is a musical movie containing a song with the similar sounding name Broadway Melody. It opens on an aerial shot of Manhattan. That's where Broadway the road lives! How did they do this aerial shot? Aerial photography was first practiced by the French photographer and balloonist Gaspard Félix Tunachon in 1858 over Paris. I don't think I'll ever get over Paris. Alas, those photos are gone forever. I bet they were great though. Or, or perhaps his renown was just a lot of... hot air? The earliest surviving aerial photograph was taken by James Wallace Black and Samuel Archer King on the 13th of October 1860 and is titled Boston as the Eagle and Wild Go See It. In 1882, the British meteorologist E.D. Archibald said sod balloons and pioneered kite aerial photography. Presumably that's tying a camera to a kite on a windy day. There's a beautiful simplicity to that. Good on him. The coincidental marriage of the dawn of aviation and the early days of cinema brought the Wright Brothers' Model A aircraft to Rome to have a motion picture camera strapped to it to film the aerial shots for the short film Wilbur Wright und sein Flugmaschine. Wilbur Wright and his flying machine. Long when, rabbit. when are we with this movie? The year it was released, 1929, was four years before the end of Prohibition in the USA. It was first released in February, seven months before the Wall Street crash, which began the worldwide Great Depression, which arguably was a significant cause of the Nazi party receiving 40% of the vote in Germany the following year, leading eventually to the Second World War and the Holocaust. This movie doesn't contain a hint of trouble in Europe. That all starts to creep in in the subsequent best pictures. The preceding movie, Wings, was about war, the succeeding movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, will be about war, but this one's about Broadway! After the aerial shot is an external establishing shot of Gleason Music Publishing Company. Inside we meet our first character, Eddie Kearns, played by Charles King. He's a dirty, cheap little songwriter. You dirty, cheap little songwriter, you! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! Gleason Music Publishing? Who's Gleason? It's got to be named after James Gleason, who co-wrote the screenplay with Norman Houston from a story by Edmund Golding. James Gleason does have an uncredited role as music publisher in this opening scene, so I've got to be right about this. In this first scene, Eddie is peddling a new song he's written, and so we're treated to the first musical number, Broadway Melody. A million hearts beat quicker there. No skies are great on the great white way. That's the Broadway melody. It's sung by Eddie and accompanied by the various musicians in the room. This performance is happening in the actual narrative. See, what I think of as a musical is having two parallel realities which intertwine. One down-to-earth one in which the story plays out in a realistic way with dialogue and cause and effect, actions have consequences, and another, actors have song sequences, which is the big impossible song and dance numbers also moving on the same story. Like developing or establishing characters and stuff, but someone can stand on the head of a giraffe on a pyramid of large animals or a a bird can be crushed by an elephant and there are no consequences to any of it in the story. It's the circle of life. I'm getting something from Wikipedia itself. It's in the room with us. Oh yes, I'm uh, once again joined by that medium from the previous episode. My only medium via which I can interview anyone who worked on these early best pictures. Wikipedia is telling me... I, I think what you might be referring to is something called non-diegetic music. Any music only heard by the viewer. Listener, which isn't actually happening in the world the characters inhabit, uh, as opposed to diegetic music of which the characters are aware slash apart. Wikipedia can talk through you. Apparently. Is it dead? Not yet. Keep donating guys. Right, it has a name, diegetic music. I wonder what diabetic music is. Absolutely no idea where you're going with that. 
I'd say all seven numbers are diegetic in this movie, save for one detail of one of them on which I promise I'll elaborate. It turns out a musical can have either both or either diegetic and or or non-diegetic musical numbers. There's type 1 and there's type 2. Oh, something in that. Be gone with you. Though we might come back to you if there's any supernatural entities which supernaturally enter you. <laughs> Your trouble's there. All out of style. But Broadway always wears a smile. Oh, that's Gene Kelly again and Singing in the Rain. That's now two songs both movies share. And there's at least one more. Hot dog. For all the songs but one, the music was by Naceo Herb Brown and the lyrics were by Arthur Freed. Arthur Freed went on to produce two Best Picture winners, An American in Paris and Gigi, so we'll be returning to him. My cat's called Gigi. I wouldn't put it past you, Gigi. Naceo Herb Brown wrote the score for Singing in the Rain. As I mentioned in the previous episode, currently I've decided Singing in the Rain is my favourite movie. Singing in the Rain was released in 1952 and wasn't even nominated for Best Picture at the 25th Academy Awards. I'm going to have to watch The Greatest Show on Earth instead. It was only nominated for two awards, Best Supporting Actress for Jean Hagen and Best Scoring of a Musical Picture for Lenny Hayton. It won neither of them. It's set in the late 1920s and comedically depicts the transition from silent movies to talkies. It's Metro Goldwyn Mayer, same as the Broadway melody. Music and lyrics by the same guys as the Broadway melody. The lyricist and aforementioned double best picture winner Arthur Freed produced it. We've got a massive connection here, people. Singing in the Rain is pretty much about the Broadway melody. Singing in the Rain is named after the song Singing in the Rain, which features in Singing in the Rain and was written by our friends Arthur Freed and Naceo Herb Brown. But it's originally from Metra Goldwyn Mayer's second ever talkie musical, The Hollywood Review of 1929, which I've already mentioned was also nominated for Best Picture at the second Academy Awards. I actually watched The Hollywood Review of 1929. It's very weird. But I saw the singing in the rain number. Then I watched 2022's Babylon, which is basically uh, singing in the rain with rude bits, and saw its depiction of filming that singing in the rain number. I've watched four movies for this episode. In the opening scene, Eddie Kearns prefaces our other two main characters, the Mahoney sisters. Kearns, Mahoney, Gleason. I guess there's an Irish thing going on here. Remember kids, Suppositions based on surnames is cool. After the song, two women latch onto Eddie about it, saying they'll smack it over for you. <laughs> sure! <laughs> but Eddie has other plans. Zenfield's bought it for his new review, and the Mahoney sisters are coming from the West to put it over for me. He has it earmarked for that sister act. Sister act? It's the sister act I told you about. And there are more sisters doing their acts over the lunch counters in New York than over the foot. Than in the theatres. Sister Act? That must be what the title of the 1992 movie Sister Act starring Whoopi Goldberg is a play on. By the way, apparently that was considered for a Best Picture nomination at the 65th Academy Awards, but didn't get one. I genuinely wasn't aware of this term, Sister Act. Andrew Sisters? Nolan Sisters? Shakespeare's Sister? You'd better hope I get it now. I feel so stupid. The Mahoney sisters are a sister act. And... Half of that sister team is going to be the future Mrs. Eddie Kearns. Ooh. Eddie and half of the Mahoney sisters in a tree. W-E-D-D-I-N-G. But which half does he hope to marry? The top? The bottom, one of each? <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing. We'll discover which sister very soon. But be warned, that line is the entire premise of the movie. It's like a witch's prophecy. 
This hard cut from silent to talky between the previous movie and this one was a little jarring for me. Wings had a musical score running under it the entire time, all non-diegetic of course. In the Broadway melody it's clear they're new to sound recording and editing. Between the lines of dialogue is eerie silence, well, loud crackling noise. Say, they run out of everything but dollar signs on this thing? <laughs> One coffee, one order of fried eggs. There's very little in the way of foley and background sound. I think they just dangled a big microphone above the action, recorded all the sound from the take and used only that. Maybe that's why they didn't have any awards relating to sound at the second Academy Awards. Oh, here's a thing. The number of awards at the second awards went from 12 down to 7. One of the awards which was discontinued, and continues to be discontinued to this day, was Best Writing Parentheses Title Writing. They dropped it because talkies no longer had much need for title cards with written dialogue. The first and only winner of the award at the first awards was Joseph W. Farnham. He was a USAN playwright, film writer and film editor and also a founding member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. He died of a heart attack at the age of 46 in 1931, also making him the first award winner to die. The in memoriam at the third awards must have been very short. Long the white rabbit. Where's a medium when you need one? I'm still here. Ah, so you are. Joseph W. Farnham is in the room with us. Tell him congratulations on co-founding the Academy and being the only winner of the title writing award. Oh, and ask him, what was it like? He's saying it was a privilege to be involved, a lot of hard work, but ultimately rewarding. Some excellent insights there. Thank him for his time. We're still in the pre-code era. He's still here. The time when Hollywood movie studios were not beholden to self-censorship according to the Hayes Code. What do I think might, like the people of Second World War era Bletchley Park, break the code in the Broadway melody? Homosexuality. Right, I'm actually not sure if there's anything much which breaks the code, but I'll try my best. There's a costume guy. He first appears early on, just after the big Broadway producer Francis Zanfield is introduced and announces he's having lunch at the Knickerbocker. Yes, sir. Oh, don't we all love lunch at the Knickerbocker? The costume guy, Terp, played by Drew Demarest, I have a suspicion is comic relief based on the gay stereotypes of effeminacy and really liking fabric. Oh, Mr. Zanfield, this material, I couldn't get it in the gold design, only in the silver. Isn't it lovely? Hmm, it's fine. Get it in the gold. Remember, I want that in the gold. Yes, sir. If I'm right, is he the target or the purveyor of the humour? Be careful of my hats! Well, we gotta get down on the stage! I don't care, I won't allow you to ruin them! I told you, they were too high and too wide. Well, big woman, I designed the costumes for the show, not the doors for the theatre. I know that. If you had, that would have been done in lavender. <laughs> now, an effeminate comic relief character I don't think actually breaks the code. The Hayes Code prohibited the depiction of sexual perversion and they included same-sex relationships. The swines! There is one fractional moment in which one of a group of high-rolling business guys hanging with the villain of the piece, we'll get on to him, seems to mock Terp's passion for fabric. It's a gorgeous garment, isn't it? Oh, isn't it gorgeous? In fact, it's the gorgeous thing I've ever seen, you sweet little cutie. And his drunken friend follows Terp as he walks off before being pulled off back to the group. Come here, unconscious. Is that a flash of this unconscious character wanting a piece of fabric cut from the same sex relationship? I'm clutching here. I'm, I'm clutching at pearls. Licentious nudity. The second scene of the movie establishes our other two main characters, the Mahoney sisters, arriving in New York City at the place they're staying, a theatrical hotel on 46th Street. Oh, I'll take that, thank you. They are Hank. Hank, yes, come look at the elegant view. Oh, that'll be all, thank you. That's Hank Mahoney, played by Bessie Love. Apparently Hank is short for Harriet. 
and Queenie Mahoney, played by Anita Page. As far as I can tell, that's just her name, Queenie. Oh, Queenie, New York, the place we've dreamed and talked about. And it's well. Yeah, but there's something about it that kind of scares me, Hank. Queenie, that's quite the moniker. But yeah, she's a queen. Baby, they were plenty smart when they made you beautiful. <laughs> Come on, let's get cleaned up before Eddie gets here. I'll run a tub for you. <laughs> yes, next is a bathroom scene as they get cleaned up for Eddie. We've all done it. Oh boy, this is going to be good! Neither of them really get nude during this scene, but they're both in various states of undress. Can you imagine my embarrassment? There is one shot of Queenie's bare shoulders in the bar. Uncle Jed! I'll be right out! It all just smacks of being intended as titillation. Let's put it this way. When I first watched this movie, that's right, I'm watching these things more than once, I was a little delirious and this early scene spanned me out a bit and I did start wondering whether I was mistakenly watching some vintage skin flick. But I persevered and thankfully it turned out legitimately to be The Broadway Melody, a movie musical from 1929. Here then are the Mahoney sisters, having just come from the West to New York City. But which half of this pair of sisters is going to be the future Mrs. Eddie Kearns? Eddie soon arrives at their apartment, giving us the answer. Uncle Jed! Hello! However, before his visit, their Uncle Jed shows up, played by Jed Prouty. Because part of him wants to tell them he has them... Booked for 30 weeks over the manly time. But most of him wants to tell Queenie... What a big girl you are! And so... so beautiful! Yep! There's a whole theme of men who haven't seen her in a while, basically one step away from My my, you've filled out. I have no idea what age Queen is meant to be. She has a birthday in the movie, but I stop myself from counting the candles on her cake. <laughs> However, the actor Anita Page was 18 when the movie was released. Oh, by the way, Uncle Jed himself is another bit of comic relief because of his... Stammer! Hank and Queenie seem to find it amusing anyway. Let me tell you, tell you, tell you, tell you... Say, what's the name of that record you're playing? Say, listen, girls. Yeah? Oh, what is it? You know, I, I love both you girls and I want to see you get along. Sure, Uncle Jed. We know that. It's not long after Uncle Jed Jed's off that Eddie arrives and Hank's Uncle Dead pleased to see him. Come in. Eddie! Hank! Oh. Hank and Eddie embrace. Oh, baby. That's right. Hank's his fiance, and he hers. Time for him to meet the half of the sister act team not intended to be the future Mrs. Eddie Kearns. That's my Queenie! Oh, but what's this? Lingering soft focus close-ups of Queenie and Eddie gazing at one another? Probably nothing, right? Bearing in mind I started this episode with him singing a love song to her. Just like Uncle Jed, it appears this is the first time he's seen grown-up Queenie. Queenie? You don't mean to tell me... He indicates a child type with his hand. Queenie, all growing up and everything. Gee whiz, you were a funny-looking thing the first time I saw you. With those gangly legs and freckles. <laughs> but you certainly turned out to be a beautiful girl. <laughs> well, I'll go get some clothes on. This lustful behaviour actually betrays Eddie's love for Queenie. Just like the previous movie, there's a love triangle. And just like the previous movie, it's a triangle with Four points. It's another four-node love network. The first proper orcs exchange between Eddie and Queenie is when Eddie gets the sisters an audition with Zanfield. Zan's decision is... I can use the blonde, but that little cluck is out. Queenie being the blonde, Hank being the little cluck. Despite Eddie's protestations... But don't you know it's tough to put comedy over on a bare stage? Preach, Eddie. 
Preach. They'll be all right at the performance. Oh, please give them another chance. It takes Queenie's innocent yet flirtatious appeal to Zanny to keep Hank in the picture. Excuse me, Mr. Zanfield. Well? I heard what you said about me. Please, couldn't you give the both of us at the same salary? I might. I think I can slip her in somewhere. Oh, thank you, Mr. Zanfield. All right. Even sparing Hank's pride. My sister is the business manager of the actors. You won't let on that it ain't the both of us you want, will you? Of course not. You send her over and I'll talk to her. Oh, thank you. He creepily taps her wrist. All right. Queenie rushes back to Hank and Eddie to tell the former the good news. I don't know nothing. Hank! On the level? Oh, gee. Well, maybe we're in after all. Sure. Now, Queenie, you let me handle it. I can always take care of these things better with nobody around. Exit delusional Hank, allowing Eddie to reveal... I heard what you said to Zanny. He's enraptured. Oh, you won't let on to Hank, will you? She enraptures him. Of course not. Gee, that was wonderful of you, Queenie. He grabs her shoulders. I could kiss you for that. A little peck on the cheek? Oh my God, it's a lingering mouth-to-mouth one. Followed by them both gazing at one another. Oh, you mustn't do that, Eddie. I guess I shouldn't. I never realized you were. Maybe Queenie's a little older than... Gee, you're the sweetest little girl I ever knew. Christ, Eddie! You mean next to Hank? Yeah, sure. The fourth node, or person, in the four-node love network is the foreshadowed villain of the piece. Here are the circumstances under which he's brought into the picture. It's the final dress rehearsal of Zanfield's review. Introduced by a title card which isn't winning any award because it can't anymore. A young female dancer in a long blonde wig, who's literally been put atop a pedestal, seems to faint and plummet to the ground. Everyone gathers round her, and she's carried off to a doctor. Zanfield's eventually informed. Well, what's the trouble now? Well, that other dame flopped. How about this one? That other dame flopped is said so casually. It implies these people have established terminology for a fatigued young woman falling from a pedestal. Zanny and his entourage all coldly peer up at this one, before turning their backs and shaking their befedored heads. Terrible! Zan commands. Where's that blonde McGuinness sister? Use her! Either Zanfield has said McGuinness sister and meant Mahoney, using Irish surnames interchangeably, or the stage manager was thrown off by Hank rushing up to Zanny to give him a piece of her mind. Mahoney's the name, and let me tell you something, Mr. Zanfield. Listen, Mr. Zanfield, I'll get her right up there. All right. Because he approaches Queenie to be the new pedestal jockey. Listen, Mahoney, we want you up on the prowl that boat. Come on now, let's get your clothes off. Jeez, take her to dinner oh, first. I don't want to take my clothes off. No, that'll be all right. But listen to me, I've never taken my clothes off in my life before. That's a joke about virginity, is it? No idea. We know she has literally taken her clothes off before. She did it in the bathroom when getting cleaned up for Eddie. Oh boy, this is going to be good! We've all done it. The curtain opens for the picture's second musical number. It's interesting to me the choice of the wide shots of the stage only framing the stage itself without any of the audience or seating. My guess is that it was a gimmick to make the movie theatre audience become the audience. Making it appear to them momentarily that they were in a Broadway theatre. The 4-3 aspect ratio helps with this. However, technically, the movie was released 1.37 to 1 sound on disc and 1.2 to 1 sound on film. And if you read that on Wikipedia, you have me to thank for putting it there. The second musical number is Love Boat, sung by men in Roman armour while the women lay around motionless. Queenie does a fantastic job smiling and pointing atop the pedestal and is admired by Eddie, which he seems to like, and some Mr. Fancy Pants high rolling business guy, of which I don't think she's aware. He's well into her. By the way, Zanny, what's the name of that little beauty on the boat? Go and ask her, it'll give you something to do. Hey, our Queenie's not just something to do. 
Everyone's very complimentary to Queenie. One fellow dancer even foreshadowing... You were great, Mahoney. I'll say you were. You'll be riding in a Rolls Royce by Thursday. <laughs> Hank's pleased for her sister's success, but apprehensive about the means. I'm glad to see him that good. Oh, but gee, we ain't never had to get by on our legs before. Eddie offers his special brand of consolation. Oh, that don't mean nothing, Hank. Those guys are not going to pay ten bucks to look at your face. <laughs> Christ, Eddie! What a dirty little songwriter. This is Broadway. Yeah. It's Broadway, not broads. Well, hey! But Eddie's one of our heroes, remember? His thirsty words to Queenie are cut short by an interruption from our high-rolling business villain. Boy, when I got a peek at you up there on that boat... Isn't this the beautiful lady of the boat? Yeah. And Eddie gives Her. him a stink eye. Yes, sir. His name is... I'm Jack Warren. Jack Warren? Jack Warner. Huh? Jack Warner? Now don't call me Mr. Warner. Call me Jack. Oh, Jock Warner. Ah! There's eventually a close-up of his business card. Subtle off-white colouring, tasteful thickness, likely has a watermark. His name is Mr. Jacques Warriner. His name is Mr. Jacques Warriner. Played by Kenneth Thompson. Now this is sassy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. It's pretty blatant this asshole's name is meant to sound similar to Jack Warner. Jack Warner and his brother Sam were the you guessed it, Warner Brothers. They were the ones to procure the technology for the first talkie, the jazz singer, which triggered this desperation from the other studios to follow suit, which included Metro Goldwyn Mayer making the Broadway melody and the Hollywood Review of 1929. They're clearly taking their revenge on Warner Brothers for pioneering talkies by writing a slimy, slicked back hair businessman villain with the subtle as an adult man saying, My, how you've grown, name Jacques Warriner. That first talkie, Warner Brothers' is, is the jazz singer, released in 1927, is a musical featuring some synchronised dialogue recorded on set, but only in a few scenes. Therefore, the Broadway melody is considered to be Hollywood's first all-talking musical. Just Hollywood's or a world first? I don't know. Wikipedia won't tell me. I haven't seen The Jazz Singer. Look, I already watched four movies for this episode. It stars Al Jolson, who plays a jazz singer who happens to perform in blackface. I don't know if you know this, but there was a lot of matter-of-fact societal racism in this era. All the way up until 1964, when the Civil Rights Act ended it forever. Follow the White Rabbit. Don't follow the White Rabbit. That's the Four Node Love Network. Hank fancies Eddie. Eddie fancies Hank and Queenie. Queenie fancies Eddie. Jacques fancies Queenie. Hank and Eddie detest Jacques. Oh, and uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer playfully rib Warner Brothers' studios. I have to mention some of the crazy language used in this movie. We've heard... But that little clock is out. And they can't get enough of On the Level. On the Level? On the Level. Queenie and me have always been on the level. I've been on the level with you. Here's your pants, sir. But there are so many more. Hot dog. Next cracking, Rosie. Paul, you're just a crepe hanger. Say, are you trying to crab our act? Yeah, and I'll fix you, you little peanut. Queenie, you can't go out with that bird. You sure are regular, Hank. Well, that's all right for you. But I ain't craving any hall room for some song and dance guy who expects me to cook his meals over gas jets and listen to a lot of smart wisecracks and bum songs. Hank even has a catchphrase which he uses near the beginning. Why, it's cream in the can, baby. And then calls back to right at the end. Why, it's cream in the can, baby. I don't know if this was an established phrase of the day or if it was writers Norman Houston and James Gleason attempting to Shakespeare it into existence. Gleason, stop trying to make cream in the can happen. It's not going to happen. I couldn't find any references to this phrase outside of this movie. But if you find it on Wiktionary, 
you have me to thank for putting it there. I'm the white rabbit. I've played three of the seven musical numbers. I'll play one more and leave the remaining unspoiled. Zanfield's review eventually opens at Zanfield Theatre. We see a close-up of someone opening a programme, revealing the wedding of the painted doll with the Zanfield Dolly Girls. Everything Zanfields, including human women. This is another song shared by Singing in the Rain, though not in full in the latter. It's part of the medley establishing the explosion of talkies and the lavish musical numbers they included. The 1929ians would have seen this particular number in the Broadway melody in dazzling Technicolor. No copy of the Technicolor version survived. However, I did find a restoration from the YouTube channel Three Stooges Critic. Here comes the bride now. Look at the little beauty. Look at the little beauty. Look at the little doll. It's a wedding day. Here comes the bride now. Look at the little cutie. Look at the little beauty. Look at the little doll. It's her wedding day. Oh, it's too catchy. Following the bride comes a bespectacled preacher man, joker dancing down the stairs, and even doing a cartwheel. He is sure he knows his stuff, cause he's done it often enough. On second thoughts, let's not listen to the wedding of the painted dolls. It is a silly song. But it is another diegetic number, as it is really taking place in the story, being part of Zanfield's review. How does this four-node love network resolve? Queenie does respond to the advances of Jacques, seeing as he can offer her a taste of the high life. Aren't you having a good time? Oh, I'm having a marvellous time, Mr. Warner. And Eddie's taken. Hank doesn't like it because she's protective of her younger sister, possibly a little envious, and doesn't appear to like seeing her have agency. I'm old enough to know my own mind and what I'm going to do, and I don't want any more cracks from you and Mr. Wise Guy Kearns about it either. You can go your way and I'll go mine. Eddie doesn't like it because he fancies her and can tell Warren is a player. I'll uh, give you a ring a little later, shall I? Jack goes to kiss Queenie. She awkwardly shies away. Eddie stands up threateningly. After Warrener departs, Eddie makes clear his... Suspicions about any guy that kisses a girl's hand. What do you mean? He'll give you a ring later. <laughs> He'll give you a ring on the telephone, but not here. He taps his ring finger. Eddie and Queenie are alone together again, and this is when he sings You Were Meant For Me to her. I couldn't sleep at all last night, thinking of you. On the level. Life was a song. You came along. I laid awake the whole night through. And this is why Queenie looks perturbed. She's torn, she's all out of place, this is how she feels. By the way, did you spot it? The song begins with strings. They aren't in the apartment. This is the only musical number which isn't fully diegetic. The vocals are diegetic, but the backing is non-diegetic. Unless Eddie is some kind of king to Queenie, and has arranged an orchestra in the room, some kind of Charles King. How do I know the vocals are diegetic? Because he's a dirty little songwriter, and after, he tells her that he wrote it for you. Queenie keeps going to fancy rich guy parties full of old businessmen and young women dancing like old businessmen are watching. Hank and Eddie get more and more stressed until Hank reveals that she can tell Eddie is in love with Queenie. I mean, it's blatant. Say, what kind of a sap are you anyway? What do you mean? You're gonna let a John like that steal her away from you because he's got a little more Jack? Well, if you do, all I can say is you're a rotten quitter. You love her, don't you? And pretends that she never loved him. Say, what do you think I've been meaning all along? I was on the level with this thing? That I was in love with you? <laughs> That's a hot one. Say, I've just been playing you for all I could get out of you for the act. 
You mean to say you've been kidding me all the time? Yeah, I've been kidding you. This is a manipulation technique to make him go and rescue her sister from yet another party. But that I to show you the right guy for her. You're a coward. You're afraid of Jock Warner. Or you go out and fight for her. But you're just yellow. You think I'm yellow, huh? Sure you're yellow. Well, I'll show you how much I'm yellow. Well, you're yellow. But she's also fully accepting Eddie should be with Queenie and not her and is totally fine with it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Warrener and Queenie are one room away from the party, alone in the bedroom of the apartment he got for her out of the kindness of his fancy rich heart. Oh, I don't know what to say. It's wonderful. Oh, I can't thank you enough. He's not half good enough for you. This scene includes an excellent example of discontinuity. I want you to have everything in the world. Queenie has a pang of self-awareness and turns her head looking perturbed. Then there's a cut to a very similar camera angle with her hair and everything noticeably very different. Discontinuity is John forgivable, as in my name is John and I'm able to forgive it. Eddie somehow has no problem getting into the fancy rich guy party. The door staff better start looking for work. He asks a businessman. Where's Queenie? I want you to meet my girlfriend. Answer the question, businessman. Eddie's just in time. Warren has been getting more physical with Queenie and more insistent. I've done all these things for you. Aren't you going to be nice to me? Oh, Jock, let me go. Why should I let you go? Please let me go, please. No, I won't let you go. You're going to stay right here with me. No, I'm not going to stay here with you. You oh, can't yes, keep me you here. Are. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'll keep you here. Well, you won't keep me here. You hear me? You won't let I me go. I will. Go. I but won't you let won't. you go. Eddie bursts in and pulls Queenie away, making sure to chastise her. I told you not to come here. Why did you come? Oh, Eddie, take me away. What do you mean, coming in here? Get out. I'll get out, but I won't get out before I'm finished with oh, you. Oh, Eddie, let's go. Listen, I've been looking all evening for you. Yes, well, now that you found me, what do you want? I'll show you what I want. Eddie Spice Girls at Warrener. He throws a punch, which doesn't land, and instead Warrener socks him in the face out of the room. Oh, darling, let me see you. Queenie's now fully woken from the fancy rich spell. And you can take your jewellery and your presents and everything that goes with it. I don't want anything to do with you. That's all there is. Let me get a shock at that guy. Eddie's scrappy doings end up as scrappy don'ts, and the businessman Uncle Phil's this jazzy Jeff out into the lobby. There we go. Resolution. A twist on the witch's prophecy from the beginning. How about that, sis? The team is going to be the future Mrs. Eddie Kearns. Ooh. He and the Queenie half wed, leaving Hank free and single, and Warrener to Jacques Wallow in the shameful loneliness of his life of wealth and young Broadway dancers. I think that's enough for this episode. On the level. Why, it's cream in the can, baby! As this is the first episode of many about a talkie, I want to mention an epiphany I had when I first watched this. We're the first people able to both see and hear people from a century ago. Watching Wings, I felt a human connection to the characters and the actors playing them, because I could see them moving around and their facial expressions. Watching the Broadway melody, I felt a stronger connection, simply because I could also hear them speak. The people of the past were much like us, though standing on the shoulders of giants ever so slightly smaller than those on whose shoulders we stand, and so on back to the first shoulder. It's shoulders all the way down. Which came first, the shoulder or the foot? You're like a plaintiff. Melody that never lets me be, for I'm John Tent. My name is John. The angels must have sent you, and they meant you just for me. In John Clusion, my name is John. The Broadway Melody is the second best movie I've seen for this endeavour. The next best picture. The next best picture will be All Quiet on the Western Front. Please do your best to join me for the next best picture in the next, the next best picture.